Wow, I, I do not even know how to follow that. That was, uh, that was legit. All I got to say is wait till next week, right, guys? We'll see. Hey, man, was that awesome? You have no idea your finance guy, operations guy had that kind of talent, man. That was uh, some good stuff. Hey, I think Ron's right. Sometimes we dive in and you hear money and you're like, oh, man, what did I show up for today? Um, not just the song starting off, Ron said, hey, we want to have a little bit of different take on this uh, over this series, but we are going to jump in for three weeks. I think this is a really important topic, but we are going to jump in in a different way. And, and so the title of the series is simply this, it's, it's Money Talks. And if you ever wondered, like if you ever thought, what would my money say if it could actually talk to me? Now, some of you don't want to know what it would say, or some of you already know, and you're like, ah, if my money talked to me, I'd be like, ah, oh, I know, I know, I know, right? Kind of like a teenager talking to their parents. Or maybe we'd say, yeah, I know, and I wish I wouldn't have done that, right? I think we know what our money would say. That's not the shocker there. Well, the shocker in this series is simply this, that there's a parallel between what our money would actually say if it was for us. Like if it was trying to help us and trying to keep us out of trouble and trying to point us toward the right direction and what's meaningful in life, the shocker would be this. If our money could talk, it would say the same things that Jesus actually said when he talked about money in Scripture. Like it's the right things. And we get this. As we go through this, you're going to just understand and say, yeah, I get it. If my money would talk, it would say that. And it's crazy because that's exactly what Jesus said in Scripture. Now, here's an interesting thing. Jesus talks a lot about money in Scripture. Like, like he does. He talks a lot about it. Actually, if, if you just kind of search through and you go through your New Testament and the Gospels, Jesus talks more about money than about heaven. Like heaven, our ultimate destination where he's trying to get us all to. He talks more about money than he talks about that. There's 35, depending on how you count, maybe 38 parables that Jesus gives throughout the Gospels. Parable's not a true story, but it's a story that makes a point. And there's 35 or 38 of them, depending on how you count, 16 out of those parables actually have to do with money, possessions, or wealth. I mean, Jesus is always telling a story because he knows it is a big deal in our culture. Here's the crazy thing about Jesus. He's a preacher, and preachers are notorious, right, for asking for what? Money. There you go, right? Some of you are going, oh, gee, what are we doing here? Huh? So here's the crazy thing about Jesus. He never once asked for money. He talks about it all the time. But he never once asked anybody for money. Now, you might be familiar with Scripture and say, well, he did ask one time. He asked Peter for a coin. And he did a coin trick. If you remember the story, he does a coin trick with a story. Go find that and, and check that out in Scripture. But then what he does after that is he gives the coin back to Peter and tells them to go pay their taxes with it. So Jesus talks about it. He's up to something with it. He's trying to do something with this idea and teach us something. But it's not trying to get your money. He's trying to get something. But it's not exactly your money. And so if our money would talk, if it could speak to us, and if it was actually for us and trying to help us, here's one thing that it would actually say. Our money would say this. I can add meaning to your life, but I'm not, get this, I am not the meaning of life. Like I can add meaning to your life. Money does. If money is a tool. It can do things. It can help us. We, we have to buy and sell. We have to take care of our life. We prepare for our future. All of those things. It says I can help you with life and provide meaning. But man, please don't get confused. I am not the meaning of life. And here's the interesting thing is money would remind us. Money would remind us that it doesn't, doesn't get much play at funerals. I mean, think about that for a second. You don't walk into a funeral and pe people talk about how much money somebody had and what they, all the possessions they had and what they bought with their money. And all, you don't talk about that, but what they do talk about potentially if they talk about money is how much somebody gave away. Like it wasn't the meaning of their life, but man, it was meaningful to them and to the people who they gave to. Money would say, hey, remember at the end of your life, I don't get a lot of play in that time where they tell stories about you. Money would also say this, to say, I'm, I'm a much better means than I am an end. In fact, if, if money becomes the end of your life and the purpose of your life, you get to that funeral, and not only are there not a lot of stories to be told about you, there's not a lot of people to hear the stories that are told about you. You see, when you really get down to it and you, you understand where meaning comes from in life, here's a true statement. Here's a true statement, that being a means to an end is what makes anything meaningful. 
Now catch that for a second. Being a means to an end, being about something bigger than itself is what makes anything meaningful in life. That's why you look at so many things that you buy and they actually don't have meaning. Like there's things that you buy as entertainment, fun things. You might buy a snowmobile, you might do this, you might do that. And how, how often do you actually use that thing? Uh, think about this for a second. How many things did you buy for your kids at Christmas and you spent all that money and it is now sitting on a shelf or it is sitting in a closet and they're not using it? Why? Because it's entertaining, but it's not meaningful. And there's a whole lot of things in our life that are entertaining, but they're not actually meaningful. And if you're going to find meaning in something, then that thing has to be a means to an end that is bigger than itself or bigger than ourselves. And so here's the thing is when you decide to be a means to an end, your money becomes becomes a mean to an end as well. Because... If being a means to an end is what makes something meaningful, that's not just true for money. That's not just true for, for possessions. That's actually true for us. We all have this desire to be about something that's bigger than ourselves. And that's why you're sitting in the seat you're sitting in today. Some of you are sitting there saying, I need something. I need some help. But a lot of us are sitting there saying, just, I want to be about something that provides purpose and meaning that's bigger than me in this life. Because I tried me and it just ain't working. So to find meaning, something has to be more meaningful than itself. It has to be a means to an end. And that's exactly what Jesus talks about in Luke chapter 16. In one of those 35 parables, he tells a story. And it's one of those, did he really say that kind of stories? Like that's what Jesus' parables usually are. It's those parables that kind of shock you. It's like, i got to think about this. It's even a little confusing. But this parable is about this idea of meaning when it comes to money, wealth, and possessions. And if you know about Luke, Luke was a guy that told a lot of stories about Jesus. So Luke wasn't a follower exactly in the sense of being a disciple, one of the apostles, the 12 apostles. But he knew some of those guys. Luke, like, meticulously went from person to person who were eyewitnesses of Jesus Eyewitnesses of his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, the whole thing. And he wrote down an account from those eyewitness interviews. And that account became so popular, so important, like so important to the church that what they did is they copied it just continually, meticulously, so they could hand it out to the other churches. They could hand it out to people who were people of faith. And it became so important along with other documents that they gathered those together and it became your New Testament. And then they took that New Testament, they put that in the Bible, and that's the account we have of Jesus. But Luke grabs this story, and he says, hey, here is how Jesus defined meaning when it it comes to money, possessions, and wealth. Luke chapter 16, starting at verse 1. It says, Jesus told his disciples. Now, when it says disciples there, it's not talking about the 12. It's talking about all the people following him. People that were committed, there was a group of women that were following him. There was the 12 that were following him. There was others like Luke that were kind of outside of that at the time. But they're following Jesus. It says, Jesus told the disciples, there was a rich, man, a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So there's a rich guy who has so much wealth that he can't manage it all. So what does he do? He hires a manager to manage all of his stuff because he can't get to it. So he hires this guy, puts him in charge. The guy buys, he sells, he signs his name to things. He runs everything this guy has, okay? And so here's what it goes. It says, so he called him, or it says the rich man was wasting his possessions. The manager was. So he called him in and he asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. So the rich man calls him in. The rich man who has so much stuff that he needs a manager to manage all his stuff calls in the manager. And he sits down with the manager and he looks at him and he says, I'm hearing things and they're not good things. So here's what I want to happen. I'm putting you on notice. And I don't know if he gave him two weeks. I don't know if he gave him a month. But he gave him a limited amount of time and a limited amount of opportunity to get the books in order and get it ready for the next person who was going to come in and manage his stuff. But what he does is he says, I want you to get the books in order and then you're done. You're out of there. So all of a sudden, the manager is thinking in his mind. He said, i got a limited amount of time. I've got a limited amount of opportunity to figure out what my next gig is going to be. And so I'm going to get these books in order, but i got to come up with a plan. And so he thinks about it, and Jesus continues, and he comes up with a plan. He says, the manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My manager is taking away my job. And I'm not strong enough to dig. He was an inside guy. 
I'm too ashamed to beg. He was too prideful to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. And so he comes up with the plan, and here's what he does. He says, so he called each one of the master's debtors. He called in each of them. The guy is incredibly wealthy. I mean, he needed a manager to manage his stuff. So he's got a bunch of people who owe him. So he calls all of them in. So he called all of them in. He asked the first one. He says, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, because I don't have a whole lot of time, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe a thousand bushels of wheat? He replied, he told him, take your bill and make it 800. Now, the audience that's listening to this has to be like kind of having some different emotions, right? Because you got wealthy people in the audience that have one opinion that are saying, this guy's a crook. Man, not only does he need to be fired, this guy needs to be thrown in jail. And then you got people who aren't wealthy that are borrowing money from people. And they're sitting there going, this guy's the greatest guy in the world. Like, I love this guy. This guy needs a high five. I wish I owed this guy money because he's going to help me out. So the money manager sits down with these people and he simply says, how much do you owe? And the first guy, he cuts it in half. Like, would you take that deal? Your house mortgage right now, would you take that deal? Come on, people, are you awake? I would take that deal. I'd take a quarter of that. I'd take take any of that deal, right? And so you know exactly what happens. He says, hey, take your number and mark it down. And the people don't know that the the owner doesn't know anything about this. This guy's always signed. He's like, wow, this is great. The owner's great. The manager's great. And they look at the guy, and here's what would happen. You know what they'd say. They'd say, thank you, and then they'd turn around and they'd say, hey, if you ever need anything, why don't you call me? And the manager's going, the dishonest manager, right? He's going, hey, I'm probably going to make that phone call sooner than you think, right? And he goes, and the implication is that he does the same thing with every single person who owes the master money. And we look at that, and if you've never read that story before, you're like, man, it is coming to this guy. When the master finds out this guy is toast, this guy is in big trouble. First time I read this passage, I'm like, wow, I just can't wait to see what happens to this guy. Not only is it fired, but in jail, off with your head or whatever it is. Not what happens. If you think that's what happens in this story, you're wrong. What happens in the story is this. In verse 8, it says the master, and if you think about these parables, right? The parables, the people are all just kind of like listening because they understand that when Jesus tells a parable, there's always characters in the parable that resemble God and a character in the, in the parable that resembles us. And so they're like, what is he going to say? Is this another parable he's smacking us? No. In verse 8, he says the master commended. He commended the dishonest manager Because he had acted shrewdly. Meaning he thought it through. Meaning he considered the implication of he had a limited amount of time. And he had a limited opportunity. And he was pretty quickly going to have a limited amount of resources. But the master gave him an opportunity. And he made the most of it. You see what Jesus is doing in this moment is teaching us that the way God looks at our money. Our wealth and our possessions is much different than the world does. He commends the man because he made the most of the opportunity that he actually had. It goes on and then Jesus just kind of jumps in and gets serious. It says, for the people in this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are people of the light. So he says, for the people of this world... Like the people of this world, he's, he's not talking about people of faith. He's talking about people of this world that don't have faith. He's talking about people of this world that see this world is basically all there is. Like the bookends of the birth certificate and the death certificate. Like there's nothing else. And so what he's saying is the people of this world, they're shrewd. They actually think through it because there's nothing beyond in their mind. Like there's nothing beyond this life. And if there's nothing beyond this life, then your life is the end. And so your money becomes a means to an end that is actually you. And Jesus is saying those kind of people actually think through that. 
Because if there's nothing else out there and beyond this life, then I better figure out how to find some joy and some happiness and take care of my life and live it up and just use all my resources for my own benefit because that's what's going to give me joy and peace. And he just kind of just says, hey, people of the light, he's talking to the Jewish people who had God, who had the law, who had the covenants, who believed in eternity and believed that this life wasn't just the bookends of birth certificate and death certificate. That there was a whole lot of time out there. He says sometimes people of the light don't actually take in the implications and think through. They're not shrewd. They don't think it through of what all this actually means in an eternal perspective. That there is more to this life, and if there's more to this life that is actually beyond us, then our money ought to be a means to an end that is not us. And it should be used not just for our benefit, but it should be used for the benefit of the one who created us and loves us and cares for us. Now, what's interesting about the whole thing with Jesus is is Jesus goes on in the next verse and he gives something very specific. And here's what he says. He just kind of leans in and he stepped out of the teaching part of this and he's just, or the parables part, and he's just teaching. Now he's saying, here's what you're supposed to do with your money, your wealth, and your possessions. Here's what he says in verse 9. He says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves. So that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Let me read that again. He says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves. So that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now, Now what Jesus does here is he takes it from just the money manager, and just the manager into this idea of eternity. And what really doesn't make sense at the time is Jesus is just a great teacher to them. He's a great teacher. It's not much about, we, he hasn't, he's done some miracles, but the death, the resurrection of Jesus hasn't really happened. But he goes to this thing that talks about death and beyond death into eternity. And what he says to us is you're right now resources. Like, you've got to understand, use these right now resources to your benefit. These right now resources can make an eternal difference. Like, think about that for a moment. Your right now resources, what Jesus is saying, if they are to be a means to an end that is beyond you, you cannot take them with you. But the implication is that your right now resources can have influence. You can't take them with you, but they can have influence beyond this life, depending on how we use them. Now, that should make no difference to you, and he uses the word eternity. It should make no difference to them except for the fact that Jesus would later go to the cross, he would die, and he would be resurrected. And we've said this before multiple times. That when a guy predicts his own death and resurrection and pulls it off, anything he says about death and resurrection in eternity, we should actually listen to. And what he's saying is your right now resources are not just for you right now. Your right now resources actually have influence in how God sees you and people see you and the stories that are told about you and the influence in eternity. What Jesus is simply saying is this, is that money is a tool and it's a tool not for you but it's a tool to be used for God if Jesus is right is right it means that we should you we should view not just a percentage that's what a lot of us do we we view that in the Bible it talks about tithing 10 percent and giving If this is right, what Jesus is talking about, it is not that we should view a percentage or 10% or whatever percent you give back to God as his. If this is right, what Jesus is talking about in this whole thing about the money manager, keyword manager, not owner. If this is right, it means that God owns 100% of all of it, not just a certain percentage. He owns it all. And when we begin to understand that, our money becomes a means to an end that is beyond ourselves. And we begin to ask the question, how can I leverage what God has given me, his stuff, how can I leverage that to make more of a difference for his purposes, not side my own, outside of me that benefits someone else. Now, I'll get really honest with you about this. When I was younger, I grew up in church, was in church every single Sunday. 
I don't know what it was. I don't know if our church didn't quite talk about this a whole lot. But whatever reason, if I was in the back with the youth ministry or the children's ministry and didn't catch it, when I got into my young adult years, it wasn't until I was out of college and in ministry. Get this, this pastor talking. Out of college, in ministry, where I heard one of our pastors speaking about this tithing issue that I knew, but speaking about it where it caught me, to where I went home and my wife and I, who grew up in kind of similar backgrounds, our parents were generous, but we didn't talk about that a whole lot, where money went, how they gave, and didn't bring us into that conversation, so it wasn't natural for us. So for us, what what would happen for me is basically the money that I made when I was in my young adult years, early on, early, early 20s, it was a means to my end. Like when I made that 1,800 bucks and I bought that cream-colored V6 Camaro that was the ugliest car. Man, it was a means to my end. I I thought I was hot stuff in that thing. But it was about what I could get and what I could do. And I sit down and I listen to this message and I'm like, wow, I'm missing something here. If it really is all his then what is the best use of his resources? And Jim, we got to talk about that. And as we began to give and we began to tithe, and tithing is a great place to start, but I don't think it's a great place to end. But as we began to give, we began to realize one thing. And I heard Andy Stanley, great pastor at North Point Community Church in, in Atlanta, say this about him and his wife and the conversation they had. It's so true. He said, our stuff, our money, possessions, and our wealth that we began to give toward Things in the church toward other things that we wanted to give toward that we were passionate about. Our stuff went from being stuff to what? Stories. You see, that's what happens when you understand that the meaning of life is being a means to an end that is bigger than yourself. And you begin to invest in that bigger end and use your resources to advance that thing. What happens is your stuff turns into stories. And if you have ever given... And given to a cause and seeing the results of those cause and seeing someone else's life change, you would just sit back and say, that's where joy comes from in life. And you would also sit back and say, I wouldn't trade the stuff for the stories any day. And so I would say to you, even around this place, I would just say if if you've ever given a dollar, if you invested, if you were here way back in 2006, 7, and 8 when We were talking about the Frederick campus and the leadership stood up here in the cast of vision for, hey, you know, we we believe that God's calling us to do something out there and someone's given some land. and, And you saw that video of those special needs kids out there and adults out there dancing. And if you ever gave a dollar toward that, you own that story. It's a part of your story. If you've ever given a dollar toward our student ministry and our kids ministry, if you've ever given a dollar at this church and and helped with missions, like every dollar you give, we take a portion and we give that outside the walls of this place. If you have ever invested tithes or over tithes or whatever, you own those stories. In our next service, we have a young lady who's going to get down into the baptistry. If you've ever given a dollar, you are part of her story because she met Jesus at this place. And somebody's baptizing her today, and she is introducing her. She is being introduced to Christ and saying, I'm living my life with you. And here's the thing. If you've ever reinvested a dime, you have helped prodigals come home. You've helped marriages be rebuilt. You have have helped people in other countries in unreached areas hear the gospel. You have helped students right here last Wednesday night sitting there and hearing about their identity and making life decisions. You've helped kids be introduced to Jesus. You've helped us feed families. In Longmont, at an elementary school, 93 families at Indian Peaks Elementary School. And you know what? Some of them, they don't know Jesus, but they know there's a church that cares about them, and you gave toward that. And when we step back and we just realize that our resources are a means to an end, and we realize that our life is a means to an end, not only does our life go toward that thing, but our money actually follows. And so our money actually is A tool, and the question I think you need to ask yourself as you think about your resources is do you want more stuff or do you want more stories? And at the end of your life, the interesting thing is going to happen is they're going to stand up and they won't talk about your stuff. They're going to talk about what? Okay, help me out. They're going to talk about what? I think we need to remember that. I think we need to be in on that. 
And I think those stories of those names of people that are coming to Christ are so incredibly important. And there are so many things that you could give out there. Uh, to do it. But I tell you, my wife and I, we sat down and we had to answer a question. How, what percentage of this income, of this stuff that God has given us, are we going to live on? And that's a good question to ask, right? Because actually everyone's going to live on a percentage of your income. So you got to decide that. And it would be much better if you decide it instead of your desires deciding it, right? Because if your desires decide that, you'll never get to this. Because what our desires want is our desires want us to fulfill every need, every want, every whatever. We see it, we buy it, we want it. But when you decide ahead of time what percentage of God's resources you're going to live on and then what percentage you could use and invest in the kingdom to advance his purposes, man, it is so much easier to stick to. And what else you see is how much God provides, how much God provides to say, hey, you're being responsible. I want to give you more to be able to give more and invest more in my kingdom. Jesus goes on and in verse 10 through 15, he just gets really pointed, and he makes a point here that we must understand. He says, whoever can be trusted with very, with very little can also be trusted with very much. Whoever can be trusted with a few dollars can be, also be trusted with a whole lot. My kids, they get $2 in their hand. They got to spend it on something, right? He's just saying, hey, if you can be trustworthy with little, you can be trustworthy with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little, little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, and you're saying, someone else's property? Like, that car is my car. The deed to that house, the bank may own the house as far as, but it's really my house. Like those clothes, those things, my retirement account, that's my stuff. That's not what Jesus is saying. And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, God's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying your money is a tool. It is a tool. It is a means to an end. But what he is also saying is your money is a test. Jesus is saying that our resources that have been given to us are a test to see whose kingdom we are most invested in. Do we want more stuff or do we want more stories? Do we want to use God's stuff in a way that it creates more stories and that's the test that he puts before us to show whether we are putting first his kingdom or putting first our own basically what jesus is saying is money would say this to us it would say this it would say i'll still be here when you're gone and the moment you think you own me i own you you see the principle of the story is it talked about a dishonest manager. Take out the word dishonest. What Jesus is really saying is, you're a manager, not an owner. And I think most of us live through our lives and we're like, no, this, I own this and God, you get a percentage. He's saying, no, I own it all and I have trust, entrusted you with it. And I want you to be shrewd. I want you to think through this in the eternal perspective, the big perspective of how can I use everything I have to advance his kingdom and make more stories happen for the gospel. The real question is this, if you're not an owner but a manager, then who are you, who are you managing it for? And if this world is a product of evolution or the Big Bang or whatever and and there's no real meaning out there and we just kind of all showed up and in the end we're going to be done. You, you can't really answer that. But if you're a Jesus follower and I'm a Jesus follower and my wife and I had that conversation way back and we know who we are managing it for, it changes a whole lot about how we look at our time, our money, and our resources. And Jesus would simply say, Manage it well, and don't get you confused. If our money could talk, it would say this, I'm a means, not an end. I'm a tool, and I'm a test. I can add meaning to your life, but I'm not the meaning of life. Now, here's where we started. started with Ron doing a pretty incredible song. But we started with Ron saying and then me saying that it's almost 
didn't really come to church expecting to hear this this morning. We weren't really excited. Some of you looked at your bullets in the last three weeks and you're going, oh, great. Here we go. But I'm committed. I'll be here, right? Some of like, I, I, don't, I don't really want to hear what my money says. I don't even know if I want to hear what Jesus says. But if you're a follower of Jesus, I think there's a huge question for us to begin to ask. I think it's a huge question when we think about, like, what percentage would we live on and what percentage would we use for God's purposes? I think there's a big question that if, if meaning comes from, if, that, if, if being a means to an end is what gives something meaning, then what ends do you want your life to be a means? If being a means to an end is what gives life meanings, then what do you want your life, your resources, your wealth, your possessions, what end do you want it to be put toward? What purpose? Because in the end of your life, somebody's going to stand up and they're going to tell some stories. And you've got to ask your question, yourself the question, what kind of stories are they going to tell? And, and if you really step back and look at this whole thing, people are going to know you by the legacy that you leave. And at the end of your life, they're going to stand up like we said. And you've got to ask yourself, what do you want to say? He had a whole lot of stuff. She ate, she drank, she was merry, and she died. <laughs> or let me tell you a story. Let me tell you this person's name, and let me tell you what they did that made a difference in my life. What do you want people lining up at the end of your life to say thank you for? And I'm telling you, it comes back to this issue. And it, God says, you can use your time, but I have also given you resources that I want you to use. I think we need to ask ourselves the question, do you want more stuff or do you want more stories? And if meaning comes from being a means to an end beyond you, then what do you want your life to be a means to an end to? The end of the story is pretty interesting because the crowd is standing around and Jesus has the disciples. He has a group of women that follow him and, and actually help resource his ministry. He has, uh, you know, other followers there. Then he has just people that want to be healed. There's all these people. And then off to the side, it says there's this one group. And it's always the group that's ticked off. Always the group that's frustrated with Jesus. Always the ones that critique every single thing that he says. Who are they? The Pharisees, right? The Pharisees. That's the way it always starts. The Pharisees. Verse 16, or verse 14 in chapter 16 says... The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever hear one time in Scripture what those guys' names are? Not once. Not many stories except bad stories told about them. We'll pick this up there next week. And I think we need to get this right. Let's tell more stories than just accumulating stuff. Why don't we stand together? We're going to close our services right now. But let's stand together. I just want to pray for you and encourage you. Um, after I get done praying, if you need prayer for anything, I'd encourage you just to come up front. I'd also encourage you, when you walk out today, there will be some people that will be standing there with some buckets. And you remember that those buckets, it's not for your trash. <laughs> it's for your giving. And it's for stories that we're trying to tell. And so I would encourage you to do that or whether you do it online, however you do it. But let's tell some more stories as a church. Why don't we pray together? Father, I just, um, I'm so grateful for people in my life who have pushed me in this issue. I'm so grateful for a church that has always been incredibly generous. And Father, I think about the stories that are told throughout the years in the history of this place, of the generosity of this people. Uh, the stories of, of people, life change, and, and so many things that have happened in families, so many things that happened in the community, so many things that have happened around the world, and it's because of this issue. And so, Father, I pray right now that you would bless this group of people incredibly. And I also pray that you would convict our hearts to be about more than ourselves. Help us to tell stories as a church. Help us to tell stories as individuals. Help our lives to lead to stories that make your name great. Father, we love you. Give us a great week, and we look forward to being back next week to continue this. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys have a fantastic week. We'll see you next Sunday.